Make up mine. If I may make a broad opening statement for this video, Team Fortress 2 weapons tend to have stats. For real, the listed stats on the TF2 weapons tooltips are oftentimes the only indicator that a new player will have in determining what weapons are worth their time. While experience will ultimately breed a more thorough understanding of your own playstyle, when you've just picked up a new weapon, all you've really got to go on is the listed stat lineup. And that's kinda messed up, because in general, TF2 does not do a good job of articulating just how important some stats are. For instance, if you were a fresh install new player with no concept of the soldier's game plan, would you think that a literal shotgun or boots that reduce self-damage would be more impactful? Or, for the purposes of this video, would you think that several weapons with perfectly fine stat lineups would be completely ruined by one singular line of red text? In this video, I want to discuss four weapons in TF2 that I feel are completely kneecapped by one singular stat, be it a core mechanic or a wayward addition as a part of a patch. Are these weapons salvageable despite these stats, or are they better left in the dustbin of TF2 history? All that said, let's roll. I'm a classic man You can be me when you look this clean I'm a classic man Let's start out with just one of the weirdest goddamn weapons in TF2, the Classic. This thing needs no introduction. It's often considered one of TF2's most bizarre outlandish weapon designs, and one that many players either strongly oppose or strongly support depending on how much they can tolerate its unique brand of gameplay. It also has a cult around it, which I'm not entirely privy to. That's one of the things that happened during my two-year-long pandemic cleanse from TF2, just like Emesis Blue and the Weapon Reskins meme. But just why is the Classic such a divisive, fittingly cult classic weapon? Let's find out. The Classic is an unlockable primary weapon for the Sniper. It's designed and modeled after the Sniper Rifle from Team Fortress Classic, as its name would imply. At a base, this weapon deals 10% less damage on body shot than stock, still dealing enough to kill light classes in one shot, but not medics. You can also not land headshots when not fully charged. As a trade-off, this weapon charges and zooms independently from one another, which is a stat that the game makes no effort to communicate the impact or importance of. Basically, holding M1 will charge your shot, decrease your movement speed to the normal sniper zoom speed, and releasing M1 will fire. At any point, whether charging or not, you can zoom in at no cost to your movement speed. This makes this gun feel overall like a sort of blend between the sniper rifle and the huntsman, with it being equally usable at short, medium, and long range, at the cost of less damage and more committal headshots. So again, like I said, this is one of the weirdest weapons in TF2. What we've effectively got here is a sniper rifle with a Huntsman firing mechanism. With the Huntsman, you hold down and release M1 to charge your arrow and fire at the cost of decreased movement speed, and the Classic does exactly that with the perks of both being hit scan and having the ability to zoom. Unlike the Huntsman, it can still comfortably drop light classes with a body shot, and due to being a sniper rifle, you don't have to worry about leading or tracking a projectile. This is just a weird little gun, and a design that I don't necessarily necessarily feel like anyone in the community was really thinking about or clamoring for prior to its release. Valve really answered a question nobody had with this weapon. Honestly, despite its reputation as a really bad or gimmicky weapon, the Classic is surprisingly fun in a casual environment, and can comfortably allow you to secure kills that would have likely been out of your grasp with stock. Being able to survey the entire battlefield, peek and blast enemy snipers, instantly drop flanking light classes, and have full uncompromised views of your peripheral while still being able to gain and maintain a charge is unironically really novel and helpful, and being able to zoom and unzoom as needed without giving up that charge is really freeing. You really don't have to worry about constantly unzooming and surveying your immediate surroundings for flankers or encroaching enemies. I can comfortably say that I won a few engagements using the Classic that I would not have been able to with another sniper primary simply due to how flexible the independent charging and zoom are. On top of that, this weapon is really satisfying to use on a feedback level. Not unlike the Hitman's Heatmaker, this weapon features a unique death effect for enemies, but whereas as the Hitman's Heatmaker pops enemies' heads, the Classic pops the enemies enemy. Your opponents pop like grapes and you kill them with this thing, which while definitely excessive, gratuitous, and lacking entirely in a gameplay purpose, is really damn satisfying and funny. Seeing an overconfident scout or spy attempt to rush you down, only to be popped like a water balloon, is unlike anything else in TF2. Honestly, if you can get adjusted to playing proactively and charging up preemptively as you approach fights, this weapon is kind of an uncontested king when it comes to dealing with flankers. While any sniper rifle can theoretically insta-drop a light class with a quick scope headshot, 
shot. Not every sniper player will be able to consistently do this, and if any enemy overextends while you're holding a charge with the classic, you basically have immediate access to an instant hit scan 135 damage shot that you just need to release M1 while looking at them to land. If you instead need to quickly zoom in and attempt a shot at a farther away target, you also have the option to do that freely. I've used these words a few times now, but I really can't stress how flexible and freeing the classic feels when you get adjusted to pre-charging your shots before engagements. Now, this all sounds amazing, right? This is pretty much a hitscan huntsman with more range, more damage, and the ability to zoom. However, you'll notice that this item is in the Weapons Ruined by One Stat video, and that I've repeatedly mentioned the condition of when you have charge. That's because, despite the classic's flexibility in terms of its range, it's remarkably restrictive at the same time, in that you cannot land headshots when not fully charged. This is gargantuan, as it effectively mandates a full charge to secure kills on any full health target with no exception. Compare this to any other sniper primary, where you have the ability to quickscope and insta-pick any enemy with 150 or less HP. This is obviously a huge component of why Sniper is such a devastating and controversial class. He's able to secure incredibly impactful kills with very little time commitment or compromising his own safety. Even the Huntsman can land a fringe headshot from any level of charge. The classic, by comparison, lacks that in-the-moment impact and is incredibly committal as a result. You need to pre-charge for every individual fight, or you'll be left caught out without meaningful damage. And when you realize that charging the classic slows the sniper to an agonizing moonwalk pace, this becomes a lot more problematic. You either need a fully charged headshot or body shot to kill anyone but a kunai spy at full health. You cannot fire off kill shots with this weapon without a 3 second time commitment beforehand, and there will be situations where you are not able to do that. This is definitely the weapon's most damning issue and the reason is in this video, but it's not the only one. For some reason that I'm not entirely privy to, you can't fire this weapon in the air, which means that drop down shots or shots after being knocked up by a soldier or air blasted are impossible. Maybe this is a thing from TF Classic, I don't know. Also, as a more cosmetic negative, this weapon's laser sight is buggy as hell and can become disjointed if you're moving your camera while charging, which can definitely throw off your aim if you're the kind of freakazoid who aims from your view model rather than your crosshair. That was me, I was that freakazoid until this past year. Lastly, the 10% body shot damage penalty is, while not as crushing as the Hitman's Heatmaker's 20, does come into focus more when you can't can't quickscope to mitigate it. Again, you need a full charge to kill anyone, no questions asked. All of these factors combined ultimately caused the classic to be a somewhat disappointing weapon. Its incredibly wacky, non-conventional mechanics and generous range are offset by it being incredibly committal to land any meaningful damage, and by it requiring the player to adjust to its playstyle to make the most out of it. While I repeatedly praise this item's in-the-moment flexibility, there's an argument to be made that, in the long term, you're better off just learning how to quickscope. When you're caught out midway through a classic charge, you're gonna stick out like a horseshoe crab in a freshwater environment. It's definitely very fun and a different type of sniper weapon, but one that's committal nature makes it more of a gimmick than a dedicated must-use. I guess you can beat the classics after all. Giving you your reward. Your eternal reward. Do you guys know we've talked about all but four, arguably three, of Spy's unlockable weapons in this series? Why don't we just quickly knock out the rest of them so that we don't have to talk about this skinny French bastard anymore? Luckily for us, Spy has two weapons that fall into the Ruin by One Stat category, and one of them is significantly more tragic than the other. Let's start out with the less contentious one, the ever-appealing yet always gimmicky Your Eternal Reward. The Your Eternal Reward is a really neat Spy weapon in TF2, as unlike the classic, it's single hand handedly sets out to provide solutions for several of Spy's fundamental issues. Enemies being alerted to backstabs by sound cues, Spy needing to manually pick disguises for the right situations, Spy being given away by the kill feed and enemy ragdolls, etc. And despite the glowing lineup of uses, it's never a knife that anyone would say is Spy's best-in-slot option. Now, that's partially due to the kunai existing, but also because this weapon has a few really crippling negatives. Let's talk about it. The Your Eternal Reward is an unlockable knife for Spy. It's got one of the most conceptually cool concepts in the game, with it allowing the spy to instantly take the place of anyone he backstabs. Basically, on backstab, the spy immediately and seamlessly disguises as his target, with him never revealing himself between stabs, and the buffer period being so brief that not even many guns have a chance to detach, nor sentries having a chance to target. On top of that, backstabs of this knife are almost completely silent, with enemy corpses instantly vanishing, the enemy not screaming, and spy not saying any voice clips, with even the kill 
kill feed not displaying any activity. The only sound that the YER makes is the immediate impact of the stab, which is much subtler than the now absent normal sound cues. As if you trade off for this incredibly tantalizing lineup of stats, this weapon causes the spy to consume cloak 33% faster, and requires an entire full cloak meter to use a normal manual disguise outside of spawn. That was a pretty wordy stat rundown, but what you should have ascertained from it is that the Your Eternal Reward is really fucking cool. When you use this knife properly, you've basically become a body snatcher. Not just by killing and disguising his victims, but also by doing it instantly and unnoticeably taking their place. You'd be surprised how often enemies don't notice or react when their teammates literally start vanishing around them. The amount of times I've stabbed people while being healed by an enemy medic and he just turns a blind eye to it and continues healing me is simply criminal. This is inarguably an incredibly tantalizing knife and through its core mechanics provides several answers to some of Spy's biggest roadblocks. On top of that, the silent killer mechanic is really helpful. Despite the intended design of Spy being that of an assassin who can chain stab an entire team, it's remarkably difficult in practice due to the very audible death screams and immediate kill feed notifications that come with securing a stab. By comparison, the Your Eternal Reward gives enemies almost no indication that anything is amiss, with only context clues and the often inaudible stab sound effect being the only signs that an imposter has breached their defenses. Basically, if you ever wanted to roleplay as the monster from The Thing in TF2, this is the item for you. Oh my god, he's so god! Cool! It so effortlessly answers some of Spy's most glaring issues, and I'm surprised that some of its core mechanics weren't baked into his design as a class and took this long to be added. Just like the classic from earlier, this may all sound extremely appealing, and just like the classic, it definitely is, but is also incredibly restrictive. Because despite fixing some of Spy's basic fundamental problems, this weapon also simultaneously overcomplicates some of Spy's basic fundamental abilities, those being cloak and manual display. Disguises. Despite the utility and immense fun factor of securing a cheeky stab and instantly taking someone's place, you've got to put forth a lot more effort to reach that stab than with any other knife. The requires a full cloak to manually disguise stat is absolutely crushing. While it might not seem like much as you're disguising with each backstab anyways, actually getting in to secure those stabs can be remarkably difficult when you can't adjust your disguise for each encounter. You basically have to make an educated guess as to who you should disguise as each time you're in spawn, as your only other option is to decloak on the battlefield and either wait for your cloak to recharge or pick up an ammo pack to be able to adjust on the fly. The tooltip does not lie. This weapon does indeed require and consume a full cloak when you manually disguise, meaning that you cannot disguise while cloaked. The game will tell you no if you attempt to without a full cloak meter. This significantly limits and restricts the spy's options and makes him entirely reliant on the knife's positive stats to get into position and maintain a disguise. And these positive stats can honestly be a bit of a curse in disguise. Not only does it take a simple spy me in voice chat to immediately sell you out, but if you happen to backstab, say, a freshly respawned heavy or faraway sniper, you're basically shit out of luck when it comes to securing any further stabs, as you can't comfortably close the distance on enemies without coming off as extremely suspicious. Your most valuable disguises, being scout, spy, and medic, are also the most difficult to secure, and your easiest disguises, like sniper and heavy, are some of your least useful. But oh, okay, why don't you just rely on your cloak instead? Well, because this knife, which already uses your cloak as a currency for your disguises, also cuts your cloak duration by one-third. On any given day, I could change my mind on which stat really damns this weapon, because the 33% faster cloak drain rate is entirely unnecessary. While it's certainly easier to work around than the limited manual disguises, especially with the Latrange, it also adds another restriction and condition to what's otherwise one of Spy's basic mechanics. The fundamental issue with the Your Eternal Reward is that it significantly handicaps all of Spy's class-defining infiltration, with the only tangible reward being the ability to disguise for free on backstab. Oh wow, how generous! I get to use one of my class's basic abilities, and all that it costed me was either one-third or all of my cloak? This weapon somehow makes you more reliant on your disguises and cloak than ever, while also simultaneously nerfing both. What the hell? This is the real problem with the Your Eternal Reward. It's an incredibly, let me stress, incredibly fun and appealing concept, but it's significant.
significantly overbalanced as a result, and using it often amounts to nothing more than a fringe novelty until your enemy catches on. Remember everything I said about the Latrange granting Spy so much more freedom and wiggle room in the Utility Primaries video? Well, yeah, this thing does the exact opposite, for the positive trade-off of being able to use what's otherwise one of Spy's basic abilities. I think the Your Eternal Reward is a very tantalizing and fun weapon, and far from the worst weapon in this video, but whenever I use it, I ultimately end up wondering if the juice is really worth the squeeze. It's definitely eternally rewarding, but also eternally damning. Oh, one, two, one, three, and a four, one, two, one, three, and a four, three headshots in a row. What do you know about that? Mm, 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 mm. So, the Your Eternal Reward is obviously not amazing, but it's also not a weapon that anyone would ever say was a meta or best in slot pick. It was always seen as a fringe novelty or gimmick and never a serious contender within Spy's lineup. Our next weapon, however, is quite the opposite, as it was considered Spy's objective best in slot revolver for several years. Then, in 2017, Valve hit it with one of the most notorious nerfs in TF2 history. Let's talk about the Ambassador. Before we get into the stat lineup though, quick history lesson. From its release until 2017, the Ambassador was the spy weapon. It was the gun that any person intending to play the class seriously and with the intention of winning would carry, and was in the upper echelons of TF2's best in slot weapons. Then, in the coveted Jungle Inferno update, Valve did the unthinkable and significantly nerfed it. This was, in the words of a much better YouTuber than me, basically every spy player of September 11th. It was an inarguable nerf to one of the game's top tier meta weapons, and a gigantic shakeup to the game's overall weapon meta. This would be like if Valve decided to nerf the Tomislav or Crusader's crossbow. It threw a huge dent into the spy meta that I'm unsure if the community has ever fully recovered from, but that ultimately begs the question, what was the nerf, and was it warranted? Let's dive in. The Ambassador is an unlockable revolver for Spy. An intricately designed, engraved piece that was clearly a labor of love for someone at Valve, its only positive stat is the ability to fire off headshots, dealing a maximum of 102 damage per headshot, this is the only non-sniper weapon in the game capable of doing this. It's also this weapon's one and only positive, with its negatives being a flat 15% damage penalty, a 20% slower firing speed, an unlisted mechanic where its accuracy is worsened, and headshot ability taken away for about a second after each shot, and its critical hits being affected by damage falloff, which was the stat added in the controversial Jungle Inferno nerf. This gives its critical hits a damage of only 58 beyond close range, or not even enough to two-shot a light class, or one-shot a kunai spy. To say that the addition of damage falloff on this gun's crits was absolutely weapon-killing is a serious understatement. It might not seem like much considering that this weapon still outputs huge damage once every few seconds at close range, but make no mistake, the niche of sniper spy and being able to instantly chunk or pick off distant enemies comboed exceptionally well with spy's basic infiltration and ability to see enemy health, and was inarguably what made it such a strong choice. To this end, I can fleetingly understand Valve's reason for this weapon's nerf. Spy is already a class capable of instantly killing anyone in the game, so giving him immediate access to a weakened version of the game's other dedicated instant kill mechanic is definitely a choice. The hyper-aggressive gun spy playstyle this thing enabled probably didn't align with Valve's vision for Spy as a class, so weakening it makes some degree of sense. I mean, wouldn't it be crazy if Spy could fire off an unlimited amount of cross-map, hit-scan, 120 damage critical sniper rounds? Fuck. Yeah, for some incredibly baffling reason, Valve saw it fit to heavily nerf the Ambassador, but leave the Diamondback completely as is. The Ambassador now, on top of its slower firing speed, buffer period between shots, and damage penalty, did pitiful damage with a headshot beyond close range, completely mitigating its intended use as a potent high-execution damage dealer. This resulted in the Ambassador being very bad. Look, I'm sorry guys, I know this thing still has its fans and truthers, but from my experience, its hefty downside and lack of damage beyond close range really leave it in kind of a lackluster position. It features an incredibly skill-intensive single positive and four crushing downsides, but that positive isn't strong enough anymore to make up for it. Unlike every other weapon on this list, which had their negatives baked into their core designs and concepts, the Ambassador truly was a strong, if skill-dependent weapon that was tipped into bad weapon territory by a 
concentrated nerf. It was already a weapon with a ton of downsides, but the addition of a condition to its only positive is what really ruined it. It's absolutely still usable, its close range burst damage is still insane, but it lacks the flexibility and devastating long range damage it used to have, and the Diamondback still has. It also doesn't have the consistent reliability of stock or the utility of the Latrange. It's just kind of an incredibly overbalanced close range burst damage option that fails to consistently outperform its alternatives. To its complete credit though, it does feel really good to land a close range headshot, and the rare occasion that you're able to time your shots and double tap a light class for 204 damage is really fun. It's also got an incredibly sleek and detailed design, this thing was clearly a favorite amongst someone at Valve during its creation, but the fact of the matter is that all this gun does is output big numbers at close range with incredibly precise aim, which the Diamondback does from any range with any level of aim. The level of effort and skill required to output big damage with the Ambassador is simply not worth the result. This is all around a weapon that, by all accounts, was left in the dust as the game progressed around it. This is all around an incredibly tragic story. While I do understand that the Ambassador was a controversial weapon and that it did enable some very unintended spy playstyles, the sheer level of disrespect Valve threw its way is unlike most other weapons in the game. Even the Righteous Bison they attempted to buff. The Ambassador really was in a mostly fine place prior to the addition of damage fall off, and I feel as though with a more lenient per shot negative, maybe only the first shot of each clip being a potential headshot or something like that, it'd be in a much better place. But more so than any other weapon on this list, this truly is a weapon that was ruined by one stat. It looks so cool too. The Brotherhood sure knows how to take someone out with style. Institute ain't got much hope against Liberty Prime. And for our last weapon in this video, let's talk about one I've already discussed in detail on this channel before, the Liberty Launcher. Now, I was originally going to pass over it for this video since I did already talk about it in detail in my Beginner's Trap Weapons video, and because I got this very ominous comment warning me not to talk about it, so if I end up dead in the next few days, at least you know who to blame. But nah, I wanted to revisit the Liberty Launcher both due to my initial discussion of it being mostly through the filter of a new player's experience with it rather than a a general weapon discussion, and because I got some very valid feedback about my thoughts toward it in that video. Full disclosure, I do not at all think that the Liberty Launcher is a bad weapon. It's arguably one of the worst rocket launchers, but the worst rocket launcher is still better than the best, like, SMG or pyro melee. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the Liberty Launcher is the best weapon we're discussing in this video. It comfortably augments soldiers' movement, it's incredibly active and flexible, and it just feels really fun to use. And yet, it still one of Soldier's weakest primaries, and it's entirely and squarely due to its one sole negative. I don't think you can really call something like that anything other than a weapon ruined by one stat, even if it is still fun. But just what is that negative, and why is it so crushing? Let's discuss. The Liberty Launcher is an unlockable rocket launcher for a soldier. It features a huge lineup of positive stats that all act as some of the objective best that a soldier player could ask for. Its rockets travel 40% faster than stock, or half as fast as the direct hit, it loads one additional rocket in its clip, allowing for 5 shots before needing to reload, and its rockets deal 25% less self damage to the soldier. As a trade off, this weapon also deals 25% less damage to enemies, giving it the lowest per rocket base damage out of all of soldiers' rockets launchers, with a base damage of 68 per hit, or slightly more than a melee swing. Right off the bat, it should be entirely obvious that this thing is not intended to be a hard carry rocket launcher for a solo soldier. Everything that it does makes soldier more dynamic and mobile at the cost of lowering his damage. This makes it less viable as a straight up frontline killing tool than stock, it allows it to flourish as a flanking roamer soldier weapon, or as the rare soldier combo tool. Starting from the top, the additional rocket per clip is actually huge. Soldier lives and dies by his clip, and even if you're not able to secure the kill with all five rockets, you're still putting out enormous pounding pressure on the enemy. Five rockets coming your way can be an intimidating and difficult thing to contend with, and with their faster projectile speed on top of that, the Liberty Launcher can allow you to hammer enemies with attacks that are simply too fast and numerous for them to counter. On the flank specifically, this thing can pretty handily match most enemies you'll run into. 
On top of that, the additional rocket combos exceptionally well with the reduced self damage. It really enhances the speed and amount of jumps you're able to perform in your rollouts, and increases the amount of attacks you'll be able to fire after a rocket jump to bomb in. This makes you a real menace on the flank. The additional rocket all around is a really huge stat, and actually causes this weapon to have only a slightly lower per clip DPS than stock, with even the faster projectile speed also somewhat cushioning it. If you're landing every rocket from a comfortable range, you're not missing out on too many important damage damage thresholds. This is obviously very game state dependent though, as you won't be in a position to fire and land your entire clip from the perfect medium range every time, but it is something to consider. One additional perk this weapon has is its utility as a combo tool. I'm not personally too into this, as I prefer to run a banner as my soldier secondary, but if you're apt to run the reserve shooter or panic attack, the Liberty Launcher can facilitate some very satisfying combos, where you deal a bunch of damage to an enemy or pop them up in the air, and then blast them with your secondary. Again, not really my thing, but totally worth trying. Now, all of these upsides are really, really strong. Again, they're some of the objective best stats that a soldier weapon can possibly have. They make every aspect of playing the class easier and more flexible, and augment pretty much all of his basic combat and mobility traits. And yet, it's not a best-in-slot pick, or even in soldier's top three best primaries. Because despite the plentiful bonuses this weapon grants soldier, he's ultimately a class who's meant to secure kills. And with this weapon, you're basically trying to kill someone with a stuffed sword. The problem with the Liberty Launcher is that Soldier is a damage-dealing class. He is not a multitasker or specialist like Engineer or Spy. His primary role on the battlefield is to engage directly with the enemies and secure important picks. I don't play or attempt to speak on the competitive side of things, but I am aware of the whole generalist-specialist thing, and the reason that Soldier is considered a generalist is because of his potent mobility and damage-dealing. The Liberty Launcher may make the Soldier more mobile and flexible, but if he can't kill people, it it really doesn't matter. To go back to the stuffed sword analogy, it's a weapon that you can definitely still attack people with, but requires a lot of hits and effort to secure kills with. Ain't nothing like firing a rocket-propelled grenade at the enemy and dealing 19 damage, or half of a critical rap assassin swing. This thing simply feels really, really weak and limp at points, and it often feels as though the damage you're dealing and kills you're securing aren't proportionate to the effort you have to put forward for them. The Liberty Launcher makes everything Soldier does easier and more consistent except for killing people, which is inarguably his most important job. It doesn't matter how well you can jump around, how flashy your combos are, or how many rockets you can fire if none of those things are fighting the enemy. Ultimately, the Liberty Launcher is a very fun, rewarding, and mobile weapon that single negative causes it to fall behind other options. It allows Soldier to be much more proactive and aggressive in pursuing kills and chasing enemies, and all around makes him much better at everything, except killing people. Even if it has an amazing lineup of positives, I can't help but qualify this weapon for this video, because its single negative stat completely nullifies them. It's not the worst rocket launcher, and definitely not among the worst weapons in the game, but it is most certainly, at the very least, held back by one stat. If the damage penalty was slightly more lenient, maybe 15 or 10% would like a splash range penalty, but the exact same positives, I think this thing could be a real contender. But as is, it's definitely fun, but not a serious consideration at most points. Give me better liberty or give me death. And that's four TF2 weapons that are ruined by one stat. I noticed that a common theme among them is that none of them are like bottom of the barrel garbage terrible, and are all just kind of comfortably mediocre. Mediocre? The Classic and Ambassador are probably the worst weapons I discussed, and both of them are still quite usable by all accounts, and I have trouble calling either of them the worst options in their respective slots. I think this is ultimately a testament to the nuance of balancing TF2 weapons, that it's often not a singular stat that makes the worst weapons in the game, and is instead often a combination of bad positives and worse negatives. As for the weapons we discussed here, they're all fringe novelties, but are all still very fun to use. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. In the words of our immortal god, Frank, Frank Reynolds. Look, I quit on that shit. You understand? I quit on it. I don't give a rat's ass about class. I live on the fringe. Fringe class is where okay, I Okay, great. Thanks. Hope you all have a fantastic day before, during, and after watching, and I'll catch you all later. Cheers.